Welcome to Life, Liberty, and Levin. It's an honor to see you, Mr. Prime Minister. Is that it? Life, Liberty, Liberty and, and Levin. Levin. That's it. I'm glad to be here. Emphasis on the Levin. I got it. <laughs> well, you know, I've noticed you've been here several days. Your relationship with the President of the United States seemed to be very unique, very personal. Is it unique and personal, and how did it get that way? It is, and it began that way. That's the way it began. Can't mm -hmm. explain it. You know, it's just like that. Do you have shared values and beliefs and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think so, but there's also a, a certain chemistry. I mean, the president likes to cut through... Um, noise. I don't want to call it noise. There are two initials in English, you know. <laughs> it just cuts right yes. through it. And uh, it's refreshing when we talk about serious things. He, he cuts right to the point, and I appreciate that. I also uh, remember him uh, when I was an ambassador of Israel to the United Nations, and he was a very prominent businessman in New York, and we occasionally sort of bumped in the same circles, but uh, we met years later. And it's, it's been a direct and very positive relationship from, from the get-go. As a matter of fact, when you served at the embassy here, mm. you spent a little chunk of your life in America. In fact, you and I went to the same high school, not together, but the same <laughs> high school, Cheltenham, outside of Philadelphia. Yep. Tell the American people about, you know, your life in America. When mm -hmm. did it start and where did it go? Well, I came here for the first time, I think, when I was eight years old for about a year. I uh, didn't know a word of English. Uh, my father came here to uh, edit the, uh, uh, he was a great professor, a great historian, but the way he made his living was that he edited encyclopedias. So he edited, they wanted him to edit uh, a great Jewish encyclopedia, which he did for a year. And then he said, it's not good enough. I don't want my name on it. But during that year, we lived in Manhattan. And I came here, um, God, I was, didn't know a word of English. It was bizarre and difficult for me. There was a girl they put next to me. Her name was Judy. And I remember Judy because she taught me English. She took out a book. It was a book of pictures. They had a dog. His name was Spot. See Spot run. Run Spot, run. And Judy, believe it or not, and my dearly, you know, my, my dear mother, they're the ones who taught me English. So that was my first year, eight to nine. Then I came back here um, from the age of 13 till the end of high school. In Cheltenham, actually, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and that's it. Then I went back to the army, and came back to study at uh, MIT. You studied at MIT. You studied. Yeah. What did you study? First, I studied architecture. Then I went to uh, uh, the business school and got a, basically an MBA. And yeah. you took a job in America for a period. Yeah, of time? I went to work for about a, a year uh, at the Boston Consulting Group. Is uh, that where you met Romney? Yeah, he was. No, he was uh, ahead of me. He was a star manager, actually. You know the horrible thing about Mitt? He looks exactly the same. <laughs> he hasn't changed. His hair hasn't moved. Nothing has moved. Right. He, he looked the same, and it was a very good place where, to be honest, I mean, I thought uh, that year that I spent there, uh, in the presence of the founder of the Boston Consulting Group, who was a real genius. He was a very eccentric genius. His name was Bruce Anderson. And I remember that I came in on the first day, Never been to a business thing. I was, uh, you know, I spent five years in the army. I was a, uh, an officer. I was a soldier and a commander in a special forces unit. Went to MIT, finished my undergraduate, finished my graduate studies, get into this consulting firm, and the first day, Bruce Henderson, this, you know, very imposing figure, must have been in his early 70s, a Virginian, he tells me, come inside, shut the door sit down, and he says, uh, you know, you're not going to be here very long uh, because you'll go back to your country. So study everything you can here because one day it will help the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this guy is bonkers. Mm -hmm. What is he talking about? You know, I'm 27 years old, and he tells me to pick up what I can because it will help the state of Israel. He was absolutely right, mm -hmm. because I learned something about how economies grow. They grow with the firms. 
The firms make the economy. You have to make it profitable for the firms to grow the economy. Now, what do we mean by firms? Companies. Companies. Entrepreneurs. Business people. That's what makes the economy grow. The guys who produce the added value are the private sectors. The guys who consume most of that is the public sector. In order to have the things that the public sector needs, like an Air Force or roads or things like that, or other things, okay, you need to have a robust private sector. I learned that more than anywhere else at the Boston Consulting Group. And part of your career in the Israeli government has been on the financial side. Yeah. When my family and I came to Israel, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Jerusalem and the unification of Jerusalem, uh -huh. I saw all these cranes, I saw this building going on, uh -huh. I saw these skyscrapers with names of American technological companies on them and so forth. Have you applied those policies as, as prime minister and so forth in Israel? Uh, with a vengeance, I'd say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer in free markets. And one of my missions, my two missions, was to free up the Israeli market, the Israeli economy, so that it becomes a free market economy, to unleash the genius that is embedded in our people. The sparks fly out the minute you, you open up uh, the marketplace, you allow enterprise, innovation, risk to fail or succeed. And I had, a, I had to do a lot of reforms. I did that uh, as prime minister, and then subsequently as finance minister, and then subsequently as prime minister again and again and again. We're still doing it. So the Israeli economy has been growing under these reforms consistently at about between four to five percent a year. Uh, and the GDP per capita will probably catch up with Japan in a, in a couple of years, Israel. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And you, but particularly in technology, mm -hmm. there seems to be a huge growth in Israel. The, the, the amount of technology that is developed in your country, and yet it's a tiny little country, and you sell it to, you know, you work with countries, massive countries like right. India and right. so forth, that's obviously part of your plan, right? It's very much my plan. It, it, it says, First of all, technology by itself doesn't do anything. You know, you want a country that had great scientists, great mathematicians, great physicists, great metallurgists. It's the Soviet Union. Didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But if you took one of these guys, you know, smuggled him out, put him in Palo Alto, you know, within two weeks he was producing a lot of added value. He was producing wealth. So technology without free markets doesn't go anywhere. Israel had technology, but it didn't have free markets. It had technology because the military, especially military intelligence, uh, produced a lot of capabilities. But unless you open it up so people could start their businesses, these incredibly gifted young men and women who come out of uh, the army or the Mossad, they want to start their startups. Well, they can't. If you have to pay 70% tax, it's not going to go anywhere. They're going to go elsewhere. So one of the things that I did the minute I became prime minister and then finance minister was to enact an enormous number of reforms, like several dozen reforms, that opened up the economy, reduced the tax rates, reduced spending, and cut the bureaucracy. I had to, it was a big challenge, you know. How do you explain this to the, the people of Israel, you know? So it took about two weeks to format uh, an economic plan, and then I had to explain it to the public, and I said this. I described my first day in basic training in the paratroops. And the commander lines us up in a big field, the whole uh, company, and he says, we're now going to take, we're do, going to do a special race. You, he points at me, Netanyahu, you pick up the guy next to you, put him on your shoulders. And the next guy, you put the guy next to you on your shoulders, and so on. And I got uh, a fairly big guy on my shoulders about my size, and I could barely take two steps forward when he blew the whistle. The guy next to me was the smallest guy in the company, and he got the biggest guy on his shoulders. He just collapsed on the spot. And the third guy was, the, was a big guy, and he had a relatively small guy on his shoulders. He took off like a rocket and won the race. And I said in the international uh, world, all national economies are pairs 
of a public sector sitting on the shoulders of a private sector. And in our case, the uh, private sector was collapsing under a public sector that got too fat. Mm -hmm. So we have to put the fat man on a diet, and we have to give a lot of oxygen to the thin man below. That's called tax relief. Mm -hmm. And we have to cut all the barriers to the competition, all the regulations that prevent that guy from running forward. This became known as the fat man, thin man, taxi cab drivers could recite. They still could recite it. And that's true. That's essentially what we ended up doing. What I ended up doing was to trim the public sector, uh, help the private sector, and remove the barriers to competition, mm -hmm. which I still have to do. I fight regulation with machetes all the time. The, uh, in addition to the economy, I watch these votes in the UN. Mm -hmm. I see the president of Guatemala. Mm -hmm. I see the leader of India. And what I notice observing Israel over the last several decades is you obviously have a big push going on where you want to take Israel's case all over the world, including in our hemisphere in America, mm -hmm. in Asia, India, and so forth. Has that borne fruit? It appears to at the UN and some other places. Well, it's certainly borne fruit in, in international uh, relations because having, having reformed the Israeli economy, we, we got the prowess of technological advance because technology with free market definitely works. And with the, you know, this, this amalgamation of big data, artificial intelligence, and connectivity, Israel is creating industries out of thin air, literally out of thin air. We have a car industry that's autonomous vehicles, world leader, literally driving the, driving the world economy. Cyber, you know, we're a tiny fraction of 1%, and we get 20%, 20% of the world investment in private uh, uh, cybersecurity, huge. Uh, on the other side, we have security. We have superb intelligence. We foiled dozens of terrorist attacks uh, of ISIS, major terrorist attacks, including the downer, downing of uh, an airliner. You can imagine what that would do. And, and, and for and all countries, you share that information. We share it. We not only do it for us, we share it with dozens of countries. We've prevented dozens of terrorist attacks, major terrorist attacks. So when you take the security interests and intelligence that countries have to protect themselves against terrorism, and that's pretty much all countries, and you take the needs for technological uh, innovation, that is driving the world right now. Both of them are present in Israel, and so everybody wants them. And that gives me the third thing, which is this massive flourishing of Israel's diplomatic relations with just about every country in the world. Not all. We're not big on North Korea, you know, not too big on Iran, but just about everyone else. And so this is the triangle. It's economic power, security power, gives you diplomatic power. That will take a few years to translate itself into the votes of this archaic body called the General Assembly of the United Nations mm -hmm. or some of the other bodies. That's, it'll take a while until they get the news. But it's happening all over the world. So Israel has never been stronger militarily, economically, diplomatically. And it's a very deliberate policy. And actually it begins with economics. Just a reminder, don't forget to watch us every weeknight on Levin TV. Go to CRTV.com or call 844-LEVIN-TV.